So, uh, yeah, I'm Tom. I'm, uh, I work at Torchbox in the UK. We, uh, we make the Wagtail CMS. We, we created Wagtail CMS that... Uh, and thank you. I was going to say, I hope some of you are familiar with it, and clearly you are. And uh, usually that's what I talk about, but um, this time somebody else did a much better job. I hope some of you went to Sarah Himes' amazing talk yesterday. And today I'm going to talk about um, machine learning, which, uh, which I think is... I think it's the most important topic in our industry. Um, I want to start with a request and an apology. The request is, the request is that um, uh, some of you pr pr find uh, an image that you can share with me on Slack uh, when the time comes, and this is going to be part of a live demo. All I ask is the image is publicly accessible and that it's uh, safe for work. And, uh, and the apology is that um, the apology is for my clickbaity title, and uh, this, this, is, this is not a talk about um, kind of Terminator-style robots coming in and, and taking over and Django fighting them or something. This is, uh, uh, it's a bit more prosaic, but, um, uh, and I think, uh, the, but I, I, brought, I, I included it because I feel like there is a confusion between these concepts, and this is something that came out when I was uh, describing this talk to, to some of my colleagues, and I think it's an understandable confusion because artificial intelligence in particular, is a term that tends to get really overloaded in the media. But um, for the most part, this is not a talk about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is, uh, I mean, the simple thing, if you, if you want to remember this, is artificial intelligence is like a superset of technologies and concepts, which includes machine learning. Machine learning is a very important component of it, but it also includes things like um, natural language processing. So a uh, highlight for me for the conference so far was the talk yesterday about gender bias in Harry Potter. Anyone come to that? And... Um, you know, that, and so that, that used some really interesting natural language processing techniques to, to identify a, a kind of range of connections between words and sentiments. Uh, and machine translation is another example, or robotics. And there, there are many of these technologies. The one that we're going to focus on is, uh, is machine learning in this talk. Um, but if you're interested in the, the wider questions around artificial intelligence, I recommend this book, Life 3.0, <clears throat> by Max Tegmark. He's a, a physics professor from MIT, but he writes in a very accessible and compelling way. And uh, his thesis is that life as we know it is going um, to come to be described in, in three phases. So version 1.0 is, uh, this is like the, the, the original, the simplest form of life. This, is, um, this could be as like a single cell amoeba or a, uh, a chicken. And, um, and what's common about, about these things is that uh, they evolve slowly, they evolve through evolution. So their hardware, their bodies evolve, but also the software, the, you know, the way that they navigate the world, the way that they, they make decisions, just happens you know, very slowly, generation by generation. And then the next big change was, was us, humans. And um, like chickens, we have relatively little control o over our bodies. So uh, we can go to the gym or we can eat a lot and we can make sort of temporary changes, but um, but we can't become 100 times stronger or faster. And again, we can, we, we're, we're restricted by, by the speed of evolution. However, what's special about humans is that we've been able to design our own software. So we can decide uh, what language to speak, or we can decide what kind of deep sphere of knowledge that we're going to, we're going to become expert in. We can decide where in the world we want to live. You know, some people are, at least are able to decide that because of their circumstances. And this is a very dramatic change. Uh, interestingly, there's a sort of 2.1, um, just to slightly muddy the waters, which is that uh, in the last 50 or so years, we have been able to make minor changes to our own hardware. We've been able to, we can replace our knees or, uh, or uh, get, get new teeth. And, um, you know, but it's, it's kind of chipping away at the edges. It's not, it's not dramatic changes. And then the big one, the subject of the book is Life 3.0. So 3.0, like us, can, um, uh, can design its own software. But uh, the crucial difference here is that it can also design its own hardware. So version 3 of Life we'll also be able to make a processor that's uh, like a hundred times faster. Um, are we going to try resetting this? Yeah, let's just... Let's keep it in. Cool, thank you. 
Um, and, and, and when this happens, then we might start seeing some very, very kind of accelerated pace of development. Uh, unfortunately, Life 3.0 is not us. Uh, Life 3.0 is, is the machines. And um, to get to Life 3.0, a lot of very hard stuff is going to happen. I mean, this is, this is going to be it's an extraordinarily hard problem to solve. And uh, it's often this is described in terms of AGI, which is uh, general artificial intelligence. So computers are really good. Computers are, are better at us now at playing chess or driving cars or calculating prime numbers. But what they lack is our extraordinary versatility. So you know, in this room, we can probably speak 10 languages. We can probably speak play 20 musical instruments, we probably have like, deep knowledge in the fundamentals of the Django ORM or uh, you know, how to make the best fish taco. And you know, this, this kind of range of skills we have is extraordinary. And actually, on my basic understanding of this so far, it feels like there's going to have to be, it's not even really clearly known yet how we're going to move from this sort of narrow intelligence that, that, uh, that's, that's already working really well to this general intelligence. Nevertheless, I mean, uh, okay, it's not true to say there's a consensus about where this will happen, but in the, in the last survey of experts in this field, the median answer at, at the point at which we achieve AGI, general intelligence, is 2050. So there are a lot of people saying it's going to take a lot longer, some people say it's going to take sooner, the median answer is, is, is 2050. And at that point, particularly when you get to human-level human AGI, sometimes AGI just means human-level AGI, then something really interesting happens because from that point, you only need to get to kind of 1% more than human, and then, then things may just kind of become recursive and rapidly increase because a machine that's 1% smarter than us is going to be better than us at building machine learning computers, and then, you know, and so on and so on. So that's, that's the sort of the, the trigger point. That's, at least that's the idea. I think it's, uh, it feels like kind of, an amazing time to be alive, right? Life 1.0, as far as we know, started around 4 billion years ago. And then humans have been around, we've been around for about uh, 100 millennia. And then this next phase is going to happen in 30 years, possibly. You know, that's, that's the median answer. In, our, in most of our lifetimes, we're going to see this, this massive change. Um, so, I don't know, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it, it's both frightening and, and, and exciting. It kind of feels to me like particularly striking that the same timescales that we're talking about this life 3.0 are the timescales in which most scientists agree that uh, we may enter the kind of cataclysmic results of climate change. And I don't know if that's just like a sort of cosmic joke that the kind of the, uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, the solution may arrive just at the same time or just after. Or, or maybe it's just like a kind of replaying of the same uh, kind of apocalypse versus messiah story that's been prevalent in world religions for, uh, for millennia too. Anyway, that's the end of the kind of the uh, metaph metaphysical bit of my talk. And the rest is, uh, is a bit more about relevance to us as uh, Django developers and focusing particularly on machine learning, this kind of specific area of, of artificial intelligence. I really like this definition of machine learning uh, by Francois Cholet. And the classical programming, so the programming that, that we do you know, day in, day out, uses rules and data to produce answers, whereas machine learning uses data and answers to produce rules. I think a good example of this is uh, with spam. So uh, how, many of you, uh, how many of you used email before Gmail? Uh, so quite a, quite a number, more than I was expecting. But So uh, uh, I did, and... Um, and uh, for those of us who, who used to have to run their own email servers, so you know, if you were worked for a, worked, you know, in your organisation, you you would have an email server, and uh, it, it, you have to deal with spam. So everyone has to deal with this this, this problem of spam. And there are tools like Spam Assassin, and you basically start writing these rules. So yeah, everyone in my contacts list, that's not spam. Um, something that you know includes like get rich quick, that's 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 spam. But then, um, you know, of course, the, the people writing spam messages are kind of aware of these rules, and they start adapting. And then you have new contacts, and they get marked as spam, and you have to, you become in this comes in this arms race of, uh, you know, your rules versus the reality. Um, and that's the kind of classical programming technique, and it's you know, the, which which is very effective in many cases, but it's, it's hard to deal with that that those kind of attacks. The machine learning technique is basically so 
what Google's trick was, and when you, know, you started using Gmail, it felt like that problem had just gone away. They took a billion messages, and they took you know, a, a load of willing volunteers in the shape of users like, like us to, to mark spam or not spam. So they took the data, and they took the answers, and then they created the rules, and then they just apply that machine learning model to say whether this message is spam or not spam. So that's a kind of simple definition of these two, two approaches. Francois Cholet, who, who, who came up with this really nice, pithy quote, he's the author of uh, Keras, which is the Python API for uh, machine learning. Uh, he works at Google. He also wrote this book, Deep Learning with Python, which is a, a fantastic introduction to these te this technology. He's also amazing on Twitter, and every day he says something in which I feel he's probably the cleverest person alive. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about four different, uh, four different techniques for machine learning. And the first one is, what is this a picture of? This is something that I think, at the first DjangoCon 10 years ago, this would have felt like a, an outlandish request to make of someone, you know. Taking this array of pixels with different colors and brightnesses, tell me what the subjects in this pitch, this, this are. I mean, imagine trying to write, write rules to, to work that out. But now, we're, I'm able to do this with uh, 12 pretty crufty lines of Python. Um, I'm not gonna kind of describe all of this, but m most of this is handling the authentication, sending the right headers, and then pinging a service. In this case, I've used Microsoft's uh, vision service. Amazon have one called Recognition, Google have one, Microsoft have one. You know, most of the big kind of cloud providers have these image recognition servers. But what's interesting about the uh, Microsoft one is that as well as tags, so the others, the others all provide tags, so they'll say human, dog. Uh, Microsoft will also do a... Um, provide a description. So I'm just, I'm sending the request, I'm getting it back, I'm doing some ugly munging because uh, I want to just get the captions that are over a particular confidence limit and pick the top one of those. Okay, this is where I'm going to move to the demo. And right, and this is where I would like uh, anyone to send me, anyone who's prepared this, to, to send me uh, an image on Slack, and we're going we're to try this out. So it just has to be publicly accessible. Uh, here's one. Oh, here's one from Amy, okay. So this is pretty cool. All right, copy link. Describe. There's the picture. A bird sitting on top of it. <laughs> All right, well, I've just scrolled down. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think it's a bird. It looks like a sort of, you know, it looks, a, looks like a bait. It's, what it, it's a sloth. That's a pretty cute sloth. But it is sitting on top of it, kind of more in the cup of coffee than next to it. All right, let's have another one. Scott. That's a massive URL. Copy link. Okay, what's this picture going to be? It's a waterfall. Ah, dut. dut. That doesn't look too hard. <laughs> Scott, that's not a dot. Uh, sure, no, that's uh, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> this is mean. All right, Tim. What's Tim? Tim. Tim's got. Whoop. Uh, copy that link. Okay, it's a nice picture. Welcome to Bummer Beach. Also, dot. Okay, this is not this is not a good live demo. Apart from <laughs> apart from the sloth, can I try one more? Has anyone got one more? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the trouble is that's not an image. That's a link to a. I'd have to get the image out of that. All right. Probably not going to make me copy the copy image address. Let's try that. Well, okay, so you know, <laughs> I think uh, Microsoft's got a bit of work to do on this one. <laughs> Thank you for all your challenging demos. Um, 
I did have some pre-prepared ones that looked really good, but I thought I'd you know, risk it a bit. Um, uh, I'm going to move on. <laughs> no, I'm not actually. I'm going to show you a pre-prepared demo. So, um, so here's, here's, here's something uh, a bit more in context. Can I zoom in on this? Yeah. All right. This is this uh, Wagtail CMS. So this is some, someone who, um, Swedish guy who works at a cool agency called Freud, I think. Freud. Um, he built this as a plug-in to Wagtail, and in fact, it uses the same service, the, the, the Microsoft one. So this is just standard Wagtail. I'm taking some images from my desktop, um, select them all, and drag them in. And this is normally the point at which I would tag them. Uh, but now we, click, we can see that the, the descriptions have been put for us. So the bottle of beer sitting next to a glass of wine, uh, red plate on the table. So the tags are there as well. You can see underneath a herd of table. There's my dog, black and brown dog. Um, and I think this is, uh, apart from the, the descriptions actually working this time, I think this is a really nice example of, uh, of, of, how, this, of how this could play out, because clearly you're not going to be able to rely on this, this yet. Um, and uh, you know, the reason that, uh, that I guess it didn't recognize the sloth is because uh, Microsoft's library of images probably doesn't include many baby sloths yet. But that will improve, so, so the, you know, the data will get better. But at the same time, we can use these techniques, I think, to kind of augment an editorial experience. So, uh, you know, for, for a situation where a content manager is dealing with a lot of images, then this is something that could speed up that process. Um, what other use cases? So accessibility. I mean, that, providing alt tags. This is like, you know, that's the reason that we're doing this. And 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 websites, you know, have a good technique for that. HTML has an answer for that as long as you provide the alt tag. But there are other situations in which case in which uh, you, you this may not be so straightforward. So, for example, you may be sharing images on the Slack channel, and you may have colleagues at work who aren't able to see those. You could write a bot that would, would take those images and prepare descriptions of them, hopefully more accurately than the ones we've seen before. Most of these, most of these uh, tools have systems for, for telling you, who can, can give you kind of whether or not this is uh, pornographic or not safe for work material. I thought a nice idea might be for language learning. You could build a really simple app that would help people like take a picture and then describe it. And you know, this could be something that you could do as a sort of simple language learning technique. Moving on, because I'm, I've only got 10 minutes left, on to sentiment analysis. So this is, this is a, perhaps a more, common, uh, a more common kind of uh, idea. And this is uh, trying to understand what the author is feeling when they write this. Um, and, and in this case, again, it's just like three lines of Python. So I just have to do the authentication bit. I send my, uh, I send my request, and then I, and I get the document tone. In this case, I'm using IBM's Watson service. IBM are really hot on this because they're, they're kind of, they're, they want to do a lot around um, bots, I think. OK, demo. Let's try the demo. Moving on to sentiment. So a classic use case for, uh, for sentiment analysis is with reviews. Uh, I'm quite, I like Mexican food. I want to see what the best Mexican restaurants are in San Diego. Uh, the top one on TripAdvisor is this one called the Taco Stand. Does anyone know it? Is it good? Yeah. Um, so I can see some reviews. Uh, if I start by picking, uh, <laughs> pick an excellent review, the best burrito of my life. Okay, so that sounds pretty positive. Let's plug that in. What's it going to say? Tone joy. No, and 0.7. That's 0.7 more. So it's like 80% joy is the sentiment expressed in this. I mean, that sounds about right for a good burrito. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, but it, I think generally bad reviews are a bit funnier. Um, so let's, uh, we remove the excellent one. Most of them are excellent. Probably is a really good place. A terrible. Uh, the, first one's the first one's good. No, but this one's funnier. I really like this one. Scan my credit card. What, what's nice about this one is the mix of outrage and honesty. <laughs> Scan my credit card. Tried to add a $40 tip to my $24, $25 bill. Nice try, you thieves. Food was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never go back. <laughs> uh, you know, I really, I, I like that guy. He's really he's prepared to uh, to be straight about it. So here, so there is joy, but it's tentative. <laughs> I think that that's that's kind of accurate. Um, so what other use cases? Customer support is the obvious one, and this is the one that of, most often comes up. So you know, you're getting feedback from customers. You want to know how they're feeling. Um, but I think there's some more interesting ideas, like uh, uh, news analysis. So, you know, if you're interested in something, if you want to like, know whether Bitcoin is going up or down, you might 
scrape 100 news articles every day and, and measure the sentiment, and you know, that might give you some indications. Or better bots, so you know, bots, writing a good bot is all about being realistic, but if you can measure the tone of the person writing to you before you respond, then you're more likely to be able to give a realis realistic answer. Okay, racing through to number three, entity extraction. This one's a bit more prosaic, but this is about fundamentally what proper nouns is this text about. And you might think you could do this yourself quite quickly using rules, like something, letters that start with capital, words that start with capital letters are probably proper nouns, but then you have to think, what about the ones at the start of the sentences? And, uh, and it turns out that this is, this is a slightly harder problem than, than you'd expect. Um, again, like 20 lines of Python. This one I'm using the Google Natural Language Service. And uh, let's try this one out. Uh, so, is, I, if I get a new, uh, it's, I'm going to take this text from uh, from the conference website. Add this into text and extract. And here are the entities that it's found out. So it, it realizes that this this piece is mainly around DjangoCon US, and that it's to do with community, and it's also to do with Django the thing. Person is a bit less useful. Um, so this is you know a pretty powerful and very accessible piece of content. I've got a really nice another dem another demo using this in Wagtail, but I'm going to skip this for now. Some examples, also, as well as content management. And in content management, I guess the main use case is like finding thematic links between pieces of content. So helping people, especially when you have, like if you have a blog with 100 articles, then you probably know what the relationships are. But if you're running a new site with the 2 million pieces of content, then you're less likely to know that this new article is related to these other articles in different ways. So using tools like this helps you create those themes. Plagiarism you know, is a big, big issue now in, in higher education in particular. You could, you could look at patterns. Okay, finally, this is the kind of perhaps the most interesting one, and it's the one that, um, that we have most control over. And broadly, this, this type of machine learning project is about working out what's going to happen next given what we already know about the past. And for this step, there's, there's, it's not just like you can't just send your bit of content and 10 lines of Python. You have to do a bit more work. So you, you prepare your, your content, you have to train, then you evaluate how well the model's working, and then you use it. For this example, I'm using, this is quite a well-known data set. It's 100 animals, a zoological database. And uh, here's a selection of them. We've got the names and then, then the attributes, which in machine learning are described as features. So uh, does it have hair? Does it have feathers? Does it have eggs? Um, and this is kind of binary. So you, we, we feed all this in. Most of the challenge in doing this, this is, um, and for this one, I'm using the Amazon machine learning service. Most of the challenge for this is like getting through the Amazon docs. And uh, while I was... Uh, while I was writing this, I found this brilliant tweet from Vicky Boykus, who, uh, and, and I feel like in, in, in what, standing up here now, I'm, I delivered both three and one from her hottest programming skills of 2018. Um, but getting info from the AWS documentation was a big challenge. So I, I, I upload my, my CSV, it has to go through S3, and then you have to explain what these fields mean. And on the most hand, Amazon got it right, so it works out that most of these are binary, made a mistake on class type, that's the final one. This is the answer we want to get. So out of all these features, we want to say what kind of animal is it? And this is, should be categorical, because it's not, it's not like a three is higher than two. Okay, let's try the demo. And this is the last one. So let's, give me an, give me an animal. Uh, what was that? Aardvark. Oh, 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 okay, okay, you've got to answer then. Aardvark. Oh, Does an aardvark have hair? No. Feathers? No. Eggs? It has hair, okay. Eggs, milk? Yes. Airborne? No. Aquatic? No. Predator? No. Toothed? Yes. Backbone? Yes. Breathes? Yes. Venomous? Yes. Fins? Yes. Tail? Yes. Domestic? Yes. Is it cat size? <laughs> Is it a mammal? Yes. Wow, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was, that was uh, so having created this model and trained it on that data and tested its evaluation, I can then, the, Amazon then provide an endpoint and I can fire off more questions like that and it will give me, it will give me the result. Uh, there's many, many applications of this, right? This is, this is kind of the main field of machine learning. So audience segmentation is the kind of classic commercial one, working out what kind of users you have. Um, uh, in our, so most of our clients are in the nonprofit space. I think it's a you know more interesting problem for us is thinking about ways we can do donations better. So you know, are they a Mac user? Where are they based in? Where are they based? Uh, what what sites did they go to beforehand? We can use tools like that to work out whether we're going to ask for $100 or $50. 
I think a nice one is like this last one. You, can, you don't have to use this on kind of big public data. You can create your own rules based on your own happiness. So you can think, what did I eat? How much sleep did I get? What did I work on today? How happy was I at the end of it? You just feed in that 100 times, and then uh, you can start learning the lessons of how to be happier. <laughs> I just want to point out, though, and I'm, I'm aware I'm out of time, so I'm going to try and race, finish through this quickly. This is a point at which, uh, for this kind of machine learning, there's more responsibility on you to get this right, okay? For example, here, this is a very simple model, but you can see that most of the, most of the creatures that begin with B are category four, mammals. If you just gave that data to Amazon, it might think that if it starts with B, it's more likely to be a mammal. We know that's correlation, not causation, but you have to, you're responsible for, for telling it that. And there are some much more sinister and dangerous areas in which machine learning can, can, can get this wrong. This is a story that came out last week. Amazon had this AI recruiting tool. This is an extraordinary story. This is, this is a quote from someone who was in, involved at Amazon at the time. They wanted, it, they wanted an engine where you give it 100 resumes and it would spit out the top five and we'll hire them. But they discovered that it, it was basically, it was not rating them in a gender neutral way. And it's because it was trained to vet applicants by observing patterns submitted to the company from over, 100, from over a 10 year period. Basically, you know, and then, and then you get these headlines that like, AI is evil, AI, you know, AI is not evil. Humans have been evil and prejudiced, and if you train computers on that historical data in which we're exhibiting those mistakes, then computers are going to continue, continue making them. So we have to be really careful, and, and there are some responsibilities on us to get this right. This is another. This is a famous post by uh, uh, Robin Spear, uh, where she did the kind of the minimum, um, built the minimum tools necessary to use like uh, a, a, a standardly available corpus of text from from news stories, and then measured sentiment across it. And then you know just these examples here show that the correlations between nationalities and positivity has this you know, really strong bias, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy for us to, to make mistakes by relying on past data and perpetuating prejudices. Okay, finally, finally, if you want to learn machine learning, I really recommend that book, Deep, uh, Deep Learning with Python, and Kaggle's this fantastic community. If you want to do something straight away with machine learning, you don't need to do that. You can just read the docs of those cloud services. It took me three hours to put those sites together, and I hope you will build something amazing with it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.